Revolutionary greetings. My name is Ian Beddoes. I'm National Political Commissar of the Zimbabwe Communist Party. Uh, greetings especially to members of the Pan-African Workers Association in Britain and also to supporters of Comrade Job Sikala in Zimbabwe because I think we're, uh, we've got a common view that we now need to move forward that the politics of Zimbabwe is dismal, as it, just as dismal as, as the economy, and we as communists believe that there is a way forward. We have our program which we call Completing the Liberation of Zimbabwe, and we believe that real liberation must be economic liberation, and by economic liberation we don't just mean taking away the economy from the white minority and giving to a black minority. We believe that the economy must belong to the people as a whole and we don't think that that can happen if, overnight. We don't believe in overnight socialism. We believe there must be a transitional phase and what we're calling for is the development of a national democratic economy and what that means is an economy in which the whole people is involved not a socialist economy as such there will be uh, room for productive capitalism but there will not be room for people who want to live by buying and selling money by deals we want production but we want the commanding heights of the economy government controlled and we want major nationalized industries with professional management not just party members not even our own party members but professional management this is what we're looking at and this is the way that we can advance now uh, there's a lot of uh, very bad misinformation about for instance, the Russian Revolution, Chinese Revolution, what happened afterwards, you know, big uh, scare thing. And even we sometimes hear that uh, Mugabe was a communist, which he was not, he was actually an anti-communist. So what we want to look at is how we can move forward. Now, what our view as communist is, is that uh, the big mistake has been the rejection of political theory, political and economic theory. Uh, as communists, we don't talk about politics and economics separately. We talk about political economy. Um, now, the liberation struggle was aided by socialist countries, uh, in particular the USSR and Cuba. We know China helped Zanu, although we uh, we believe that the original liberation movement uh, in Zimbabwe was ZAPU and we are very clear that uh, the ZANU breakaway which happened in 1963 was aided by British intelligence. So uh, I don't want to dwell on that at this time and I'm quite willing to do another uh, broadcast to explain exactly what, what happened but what we need is a national democratic economy as the next step because you can talk about human rights you can talk about the constitution but if people don't have work if the economy is not working nothing will go forward the first thing we have to do is to restore production the second thing we have to do is that having restored production we must make sure that all Zimbabweans benefit from the improved production. So that's what our view is based on. Uh, at the moment, uh, I'm in South Africa at, the mo at present, by the way, I'm a, I'm a, a veteran of Mkontoe Siswe. I was I'm born in Britain, but I work for MK Intelligence, was sent to Zimbabwe uh, during the 1980s. Uh, at the time of the Unity Accord uh, to find out what 
the Solomon PF government was up to and because uh, Mugabe had blocked Mkontuwe Seasway from using Zimbabwe as a rear base and so we wouldn't know what happened. In the end I stayed in Zimbabwe and I married a Zimbabwe. My wife is a Sandler ex-combatant so that's a little bit of, of my background and how uh, I got here. But uh, I know many of you are trade unionists. I just want to say that I started my political life as a trade unionist. Uh, I took part in the uh, 1972 13-week building workers strike in Britain uh, and I joined the Communist Party in Britain soon after that. I worked with SAPL and the ANC of South Africa in, in Britain so I've got quite a long history um, and I'm now political commissar for the Zimbabwe Communist Party. Now if we look at Zimbabwe and other countries in Africa, where did we go wrong? Well, I think one of the most important things is we rejected theory. If we look at the formation of the, or the reformation of the Southern Rhodesian African National Congress in 1957, it was done by the workers. The SRANC had started in uh, 1913, it was uh, part of the African National Congress which was covered all of Southern Africa, not just only the Union of South Africa as it was at the time, uh, Zimbabwe or Southern Rhodesia was part of that. But it was weak, it was not very militant. But in 1957, militant workers took over the South the Southern Rhodesian African National Congress and turned into a fighting organisation. And uh, they chose the leader of the biggest trade union, president of the biggest trade union, who was Joshua Ngomo, president of the Railway Workers Union, to be the leader of, of the new organisation. So the new organisation was led by workers. Where did it go wrong? Where did the chefs come in? I think part of it, or a very big part of it, was because we ignored theory. We thought, get rid of the whites, everything will be all right, we'll get some arms from the Soviets, from the Chinese, and then once we get into power, that's it. We've got rid of the whites, everything will, will be all right. Well, that is not what Marxism, Leninism, or we prefer the term scientific socialism, that's not what, what it's about. Scientific socialism is about understanding the economic conditions of the country in which you live, the traditions of the country in, in which you live, and having understood those things and understanding them in the world context, and the world context is changing at the moment, uh, BRICS is coming up, uh, and US and European imperialism is going down the toilet. Uh, so we must find out how we adapt into the new situation. Um, and if we look at how real communists operated, we can look at the early Rus Russian Revolution and what Lenin did in the early stages, because it's quite interesting. Two things I want to talk about. In South Africa, and Zimbabwe were undergoing load shedding because there's been no planning in terms of uh, electricity. In 1917, after the revolution, apart from a few rich people who had uh, private generating capacity, there was no electricity in, in the Russian Empire at that time. Immediately after the revolution, Civil war broke out, 14 countries invaded, but the Bolsheviks held on. They cleared out all the foreign invaders, and they also cleared out the local reactionaries known as the white generals. White not because of the colour of their skin, but the colour of their uniforms. By 1920, apart from some sections in the Far East, they defeated the reactionary forces. So what did Lenin do? He called in a guy called Gleb. Uh, 
a Bolshevik, but he was an electrical engineer, very uh, skilled. And he says, I want to electrify the whole country. Now, this is a country the size of the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. If you can imagine a country which would, uh, in size, would encompass uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, DRC, Ethiopia, Nigeria. That's the size of the country that, that you're, you're looking at. And this plan was made, and within 12 years, the plan was implemented. Within 12 years, they electrified the whole country. Within the next nine years, from 1931 or 32 to 1941, when the Germans invaded, they tripled their generating capacity and they built their industry. And they built an industry which was powerful enough to build a, what was then necessary tanks and uh, guns, aeroplanes, to defeat Nazi Germany. They did it within a short space of time. 21 years. Now how long has Zimbabwe been independent? And we've only seen a reduction in, in, in industry. So we believe in economic planning. And despite the, the racism of the Rhodesians, especially after sanctions were imposed, they introduced economic planning. Now this is a very uh, interesting thing because uh, capitalism, which rejects economic planning, has always used economic planning when they're in trouble. Um, the British did it during the Second World War. After the Second World War, the IMF and the World Bank was not the same as it is now. Uh, they adopted Keynesian economics. They didn't uh, turn to socialism as such, but they did say right, we're going to control profits, we're going to push up workers' wages, uh, we're going to control the banking system because we want to restore production. It's only after they restored production and the capitalists said, hey, we, we don't make enough money. So then they started to talk about other things, about making money, and of course making money without production. And this is what happened in Zimbabwe. So, after independence, uh, and this happened across Africa, we gave up Marxism, Leninism, Marxism, Leninism for the majority, the majority of our leadership. There were a few uh, genuine guys who accepted that scientific socialism is more about building the economy than about defeating the enemy and guerrilla warfare. But they hadn't understood that. What they wanted was assistance from the socialist countries to overthrow the whites and then to take over as the new ruling elite. And bit by bit any ideas of socialism, there was never any socialism in Zimbabwe, whatever anybody might tell you, was, was thrown away. And even basic economic planning was, was thrown away. Uh, they didn't know how to control the economy, so they brought in an expert, Bernard Cicero, who had a thorough neoliberal background. And by 1991, we adopted the Economic Structural Adjustment Program, ESAP. And, uh, we threw away economic independence. Uh, economic independence had been, uh, and this is a twist in Zimbabwe political economy, economic independence had been gained by the Rhodesians against the imperialists, but was given away, wasn't even sold, they didn't even sell out. It was given away in 1991 by the ZANU-PF government that gave away our economic independence. I just want to talk about uh, the question of imperialism because this is not properly understood imperialism in Africa. Uh, imperialism in Africa was imposed after the Berlin Conference of uh, 1885 when Africa was divided amongst the European, uh, major European countries, uh, everybody getting a slice. Uh, 
uh, and that's when imperialism became very serious in, in Africa. Yes, they traded with slaves and all kinds of nasty things before that, but they didn't actually control Africa. Uh, so the first armed uprising against imperialism happened in, in Algeria in the 1950s and very soon after that in Kenya the Land and Freedom Army, otherwise known as the Mau Mau, actually killed some white settlers uh, and the reaction of French and the British was uh, vicious. Many Kenyans were killed, many Algerians were killed, but in the end the French and the British both recognised that they couldn't carry on in the same way. But these wars were expensive for them and also gave, given them a very bad name. So they adopted the policy of neo-colonialism uh, and that is that, yeah, you can have your black president, your national flag, your national anthem, as long as we control the economy, this is what's been going on. Uh, now, when they came down to southern Africa, they had a problem because the Portuguese were not interested in giving any black person any power whatsoever. Uh, and this is what happened in Angola and Mozambique. And uh, the colonial administrations of Rhodesia and South Africa were not interested at all in, in giving up their administration to black people. But what we should understand, the Rhodesians were not the imperialists. They were a product of an earlier form of imperialism, which the big imperialists, the guys who live in London and Paris and Washington, they didn't need those white racist governments anymore. What they wanted, they wanted black governments which they could control. But they certainly didn't need black governments which were going to introduce any measure, measure of socialism or national economic independence. That they didn't need. So the whole story was about manipulation of, of the process because they recognised that those white racist governments could not, uh, could not survive. Now it, the interesting thing is when they put sanctions against the Rhodesians, the Rhodesians <coughs> created a relatively independent economy, which we inherited for the first 11 years of independence and which, as I say, we, was given up by Bernard Chizero. Uh, why? Because the Sonu PF government had no idea of how to run an economy and they still don't. Uh, now we're seeing people complain about Chinese coming in. So why are the Chinese coming in? Our leadership, although they're following the capitalist road, they're not even real capitalists. A real capitalist sets up a factory, gets production going, yes, underpays the workers and makes a nice profit from each worker and the thing carries on, and he's making a lot of profits and the workers get just about enough money to, to survive. That is capitalism. And of course there's a finished product at the end of the day. Our guys don't know that. All they do is loot. And uh, they, in the, at the end of the day they have to bring someone else in to run the industry because they do not know how to organise production. And the real capitalist knows how to organise production. And if we've got genuine socialism, we know how to organise production. But our guys have got no idea about that. So there was the rejection of national planning, which happened in 1991. And the real killer was the slogan, making money makes sense, which happened in the early 90s. And of course, that carried on until 2008 and yes it did make sense because we all became millionaires and trillionaires <laughs> but the unfortunate thing is that money was worthless because it was not based on production and if we look in simple terms at the world economy at the moment the difference between China 
and the United States. Why is the new US economy going down the toilet and bringing Europe with it and the Chinese economy is expanding? It's very simple. That the US economy is based on money, buying and selling of money, controlling financial markets. The Chinese economy is based on production. And the four biggest banks in the world are now Chinese. And against what all the economic textbooks tell you, those banks are all state-owned, they're sectoral banks, one dealing with agriculture, another with industry, another with trade, that kind of thing. And they're now the biggest banks in the world. And by the way, they give loans at low interest rates to Chinese industry and sometimes outside of, of China. So if we want to move forward, production must come first. Production must be central to everything we do. Before we can have production, we must have infrastructure, to some extent roads, uh, railways, but more importantly, electricity and water, those are the essentials. So we need a national plan. And this is what's at the centre of, uh, of, of everything that we're talking about in Zimbabwe. Now, we come to the opposition. Uh, with the introduction of e ESAP, uh, we see that uh, the trade union movement became very worried because real wages were starting to go down and by around about 1995 there was talk about the formation of a workers' party which was opposed to neoliberalism. But then what happened? Because again there was lack of political theory, of political and economic theory by the time that the MDC was formed, they, who was the economic spokesperson, Eddie Cross, an extreme neoliberal who is now a big fan of uh, Emerson Munangagwa. So, uh, and the MDC became, because they were getting money from the West, they became the spokesperson for the West. Uh, Mugabe had fallen out with the West over the Congo War. And by the way, sanctions did not start after war veterans went on the land. They started before that. They started precisely because of the Congo War. And uh, if you read Zidera, you'll find that out. And uh, unfortunately, the MDC historically has told uh, people a lie that sanctions are only against individuals. He says, total life, we read Sidere, you'll see the sanctions are against the whole of Zimbabwe. But there again, uh, the Rhodesians manage very well under sanctions. Iran has managed very well under sanctions. Cuba, has, uh, under, with no natural resources to talk about, has got a very good health system, a very good education system, under sanctions. So as much as we must be opposed to sanctions, and we don't think the USA or Britain has got the right to put anybody under sanctions in the world, nevertheless, uh, if we'd have adopted correct policies when the sanctions started, instead of the black elite continuing to loot, we would be in a different position at the current time. So uh, this is this is the state we're in. But what we're saying is we need national planning, and we need to lock into the fact that the world is changing. The U.S. and British uh, uh, rule of the world. France, as we can see in West Africa, is really in a problem. So we need a new way forward. And uh, I'm afraid Chamisa, with all his quotation of biblical verses and his love of Zionist Israel, is not going to take us anywhere. And we know that uh, Zanopiev hasn't taken us anywhere. Uh, the, it's now become a, a party of the looting class. We need a new beginning. The opposition haven't even talked about the economy. 
not in any real terms. All they talk about is foreign direct investment. No plan. There's no serious planning. And yet we need infrastructure. If we look currently at those countries which throw out the French, the Sahel Alliance, that is uh, Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger, they're already working on building their infrastructure. But what is the opposition on about? Human rights. What human rights are there for people who don't have jobs when the economy is, is in such a bad state? And even when you talk about democracy, what democracy is there when you don't control the means of production? It's a bogus democracy. So what we're saying to the Zimbabwean people is we must have a planned economy. Economic planning must be there and the economic plan must be shared among the people. We also say we must do away with privatisation. All those companies which were privatised must be nationalised again, but not with <coughs> political appointees. We must have professional management running all those companies because the question of management is very important. Uh, it's crucial. We must have management regardless of their political uh, personal political affiliation, we must have proper management in place, but the ownership must be national of the commanding heights of the economy. Most of all, the banking system must be either under direct control or, uh, or at least be under severe uh, financial controls because the banks don't produce anything. The banks buy and sell money. So one of the characteristics of the neoliberal uh, agenda which has been uh, in place since around 1980 worldwide is that you should do away with banking regulations. And as a result, the US economy, and it's the US which is at the center, is in severe problems because there's very little production. The US dollar is only strong because it became at an earlier stage the world trading currency so they can print dollars and now people are getting wise to it throughout the world that the US dollar can no longer be the main means of, of, of trade and this is what BRICS is about Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa plus and you're looking at Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia and, and other countries. This is not a socialist thing, but it's the rejection of US violent US imperialism and manipulation of the financial markets. So the world is now changing and we have to find our place in that. But we can only do it if we have financial planning. And if we have national planning and the planning must be based on production. Why, in the most simple terms, is the USA collapsing and China is expanding? Very simple. The US economy is based on money uh, and the Chinese economy is based on production. In China, the four major banks, which by, by the way are now the four biggest banks in the world are all nationally owned. They're sectoral banks. You've got the Bank for Agriculture, Bank for Industry, a Bank for Trade. So you've got four sectoral banks who are now the biggest banks in the world. And they give loans at low interest rates to Chinese industry. In the US, the banks are in total control. So if we want to move forward, we need to look at production first and money second. And in my view, I've been saying for a very long time, 
the slogan which destroyed Zimbabwe, if those of you remember in the early 90s, was Kingdom Securities advert saying, making money makes, makes sense. And Zimbabweans listen to that, of course. That sounds very good, making money makes sense. And of course, by 2008, we were all billionaires, but very poor billionaires because the money was worthless, because we didn't have production, our currency was not based on, on production. And uh, so the BF has not learned its lesson. They bought in Bernard Chizero, they had the collapse of the economy. So now they bring in Tulin uh, Nube, uh, and he carried out exactly the same kind of policies. We, as communists, warned the people of Zimbabwe and the government very early, don't bring back the Zimbabwe dollar until we've got production re-established. No, they didn't listen. Oh, we need our own currency. So we see what's, what's happened, hyperinflation. So what we're saying is the immediate thing that we need is to go back to a multi-currency uh, regime with not the US dollar but the South African rand as the currency of reference and also we must go back to being able to even buy vegetables on the street through our phones because if there's a currency shortage, yeah, if we're using our phones to buy then we don't need so much currency. So we believe that that's the immediate way forward. Abolish the Zimbabwe dollar at least until the time comes when we have restored production. What is the next phase? We need enough electricity and the other thing is we need water. Water and electricity are the two primary uh, things that we need in order to build production. We need to rebuild the Cisco still. Now, we can do 50-50 agreements with other countries. If we don't have the capacity, we can do 50-50 agreements with other countries. But the 50-50 agreement should be directly with government or with provincial government, not with uh, so-called indigenous entrepreneurs. If the indigenous entrepreneur wants to come in, he must be part of the 49%, not of the 51%, which will be government-owned or people-owned. So that's what we need to do to start to plan the economy. So where do we go from that? We need professionals to put together uh, a draft economic plan. Uh, based on the realities of what is known, that draft economic plan should then be circulated around the country and be discussed at every ward level. From the ward level, we need then to organise meetings at town and district level where people from the wards go and they put their ideas in and they say, they look at how the national plan can be implemented or where maybe it cannot be implemented where maybe the guys at the top don't understand the local conditions. So people understand the local conditions. So then from there we get a district plan, we get a provincial plan because people from the districts now go to the province, they create a provincial plan, development plan, or it may be a town plan, city plan, but every district, every town, every city must have a development plan. And then finally we get the finalised national plan, which then revisits the draft and, uh, you know, what, whatever alterations are needed and the people own the plan. It's something which everybody has had a say in. And then we can start to, to develop. Even these things of uh, ethnic differences, people will feel that, oh, my area, let's say, is, is Kananga. Let's, 
let's show what we can do as Kalangas or as Daos or whatever else. Let them be pride in their district, in their ethnicity, as part of the whole. Once we start production, a lot of ethnic division will automatically, without going any further, once people start working, a lot of the ethnic problems will already be overcome. That doesn't mean to say, of course, we don't still have to, produce, have to talk against ethnic division, but the economic basis for ethnic division will at least be partly o overcome by having that national plan. So we're calling for national planning. If we have a national plan, we can then decide where we want uh, to work with a foreign country or a foreign company, not for them to come in just freely and do what they want, to dig up our minerals, not to produce anything, uh, and just to take the minerals out, out, of the, out of the country. They have to come in on our terms, if we need them. If we don't need them, all the better. If we do need them, they must come in on our terms. And they must agree to our labour laws. This thing that uh, com uh, companies, both indigenous and foreign, and especially looking at Chinese companies, can come in and do what they want. No, we, we, we can't allow that. Uh, by the way, I, I work in Botswana for a Chinese company myself. I'm a builder by trade. I worked on a roads job, uh, building roads in northern Botswana. Um, one of the things, there weren't that many problems. Why? Because the Botswana Labour Office is very strong. So as much as people may not like the, the, the Chinese, you'll find that if the Labour Office put their foot down, that they will agree to what is done. And if they don't want to agree, then they must be thrown out and a contract given to someone else who will agree to, to our labour laws. So some of the problems are of our own making in that we don't have strong trade unions a lot of the time to make sure that labour laws are adhered to. Uh, and in in our view as the Communist Party, uh, the trade union movement has been far too interested in pushing a political agenda, which is actually a pro-imperialist agenda, because uh, as much as Zonu PF got in with the aid of the imperialists, once Mugabe sent troops to Congo, he fell out with them, and so they wanted an alternative imperialist front. And I'm sorry to say with, to those of you with a triple C MDC background that as much as the idea for the MDC in the 90s was, uh, was pro-worker, was opposed to ESAP, by the time the MDC was actually formed in late 1999, it, was, it had changed. Uh, Eddie Cross was a neoliberal. He was the first, your first economic uh, advisor, and so from the from the very beginning, MDC became a tool of the imperialists and of the white farmers. And as we know, Zonu PF is totally corrupt. They're, they're only in it for for themselves. We need a new party, we need a new mass party. Now, the Zimbabwe Communist Party sees itself as a vanguard party. You can not only join our party as a full member once you've gone through induction. And we're not saying everybody must become a communist, but we believe that our policies are clear. We know which way we're going, especially in this changing world where the US is going down. Russia and China are coming up, BRICS is coming up, uh, countries in West Africa, in Latin America are throwing off the chains of US imperialism. So we now 
have to find a way in Zimbabwe. We need to create a mass party, a mass labour organisation of workers and peasants, which will now take over from both Zona PF and Triple C. We don't want to make any bones about it. We have to go forward. Thank you very much.